and uh, we're going to talk about the people of the of the church and how they are designed to be mature people. In fact, last week uh, we we started and we talked about there's no other way to say it but the old people of the church. I mean, it's really it's what the Bible says, and I got to stick to the Bible, right? It's called, it says older men and older women of the church, so I got to call them the old people of the church. But uh, what I didn't spend as much time on is just that clear message that it doesn't matter old or young, the people of the church are meant, uh, are supposed to exemplify Christ. There should be a maturity, especially among the older people of the church. We're going to see today among the younger people of the church as well. And as you recall, I gave a very vague non-definition of what older means. Um, that uh, a lot of scholars say it's 60 I think it's more like 40, and uh, so you put that cut off where you want. A few people have tried to argue with me about that, even this morning. And uh, the whole point, though, of this passage is that the people of the church are, t- are supposed to ex- exemplify uh, sound teaching or sound doctrine. In fact, the word that is used in verse 1 is proper. And the word literally means to be built up and be conspicuous or stick out, uh, to stand out in the, uh, among the, the people around it. And so if you would, just read with me. We'll start in verse 1. We'll read through last week's and into this week's. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, the older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may, be, may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So in the last section, we talked. Uh, we really ended with the older women admonishing or teaching or training the younger women. And now we're going to get into those characteristics. I think it's seven characteristics of a younger woman, uh, a young, mature woman. So I'm going to keep putting that adjective in there, mature. That's the whole point of the passage is, the people of the church, doesn't matter what their age is, they're to be mature. And it's the job of the older to teach the younger what that maturity looks like. I've heard this passage preached poorly multiple times off of one, one basis. And that is that, that this is putting women back in their place. And... Uh, Nothing could really be further from what's really going on in Crete with Titus. And I want you to understand, even as I, we could read these descriptors in a way that would, be, uh, that would be improper. But if we have studied Crete a little bit like we have, and we know that the people of Crete are actually uh, agnostic. And, and as, as agnostics, they delight in intellect. And so the, the women of the, ch- of the churches of Crete, or the women of the people of Crete, the island of Crete, were actually held in very high esteem as being highly intellectual and valuable people of society. And so uh, we're going to get to some of these characteristics, and, and I, I want you just to remember that the cultural setting is not a bunch of oppressed women who need to, to stick in subservient roles. It's also not a, a culture of of women who need to go back to subservient roles. That's not what the passage is saying. The passage is exemplifying how we live out with excellence what it means to be a servant of Christ. 
fact, I read, I read something this week I wanted to share with you on discipling, which really, this is a passage all about discipling, discipleship. That's, that's entirely what it's about. This, all, of, all of the book of Titus is about this. Titus is to raise up mature people in the church, to set things in order, to help people be proper or stand out, stick out as being followers of Christ. And I read this week uh, in this book on discipleship, I read this, and it kind of stuck out, made me think. It says, if you've never seen pigs come to a trough for mealtime, you can probably imagine it. Pushing, shoving, snorting, swallowing as much as they can with no thought for others. Here's a funny question we're thinking about for a moment. Is that how you attended church this week? No, I'm not calling you a pig, but stop and consider where did you park? What time did you get to church? Where did you sit? Who did you speak to? Each one of these decisions provided you with an opportunity to give yourself to others and so join in the work of Christ or to provide you an opportunity to look out for yourself and do what is best for you. So which was it? Did you consciously strategize how to bless others with each one of these decisions? Being a disciple of Jesus means orienting our lives towards others just as Jesus did. I thought, very thought-provoking, very vivid illustration. May we come not as pigs ready to, to consume all the slop we can. Hopefully my preaching is not described as slop. But, uh, but that we come to, to serve and to care for others. And so that's what we arrive at at verse 4 of chapter 2. In fact, verse 4 is really a, a, just a, a continuation of what's been going on in verse 3. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husband, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So let's look at the character of these young, mature women. And really, it's the, again, I'll say it probably five more times, it's the old, old mature women who are teaching this to the young mature women. First, to love their husbands. And I find this interesting just because of what our society has done with the word love and how it's twisted the word love to be purely an emotion that is based off of passion. When here, they're, they're told to love or learn to love your husband. So it's a, love is an action, we know that. But here they're told to learn to love their husbands, which is a, a, a willing and determined love. It's something that can grow and be fostered. It, it, genuine love is built, and it's nurtured. Because love isn't based on worthiness. It's not based on whether the person deserves it or doesn't deserve it. It's not based on desire. It's based on a command from God for us to demonstrate a commitment to Him. In loving others. And by the way, the same command is given to men. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, we're told to husbands are to love their wives even as Christ loved the church, which is huge, sacrificial. They're also told to love their children in this passage, which comes at times more natural because children are easier to love because they're more innocent, right? This goes to my point that love is, is, is not something we do just because it's deserved. It's something that we're commanded to do to demonstrate and uh, to evidence God's goodness. And we're to love our children. And they're, we're to do it in a way that's self, selfless and sacrificial. And this type of love carries every component. It, think about what, what it, it relates to a child, but even think back how it relates to a spouse. That we're to love people to meet the emotional needs that they have. We're to love people in such a way that we meet the physical care that they need. We're to love people so that they're socially developed the way they're supposed to be. We're to love people so that they're intellectually trained the way that they need to be. And we're to love them in a way that spiritually nourishes them. Love covers all of that, and it's learned, and it grows in us, and it's something we can nurture and develop. And the older women are to teach the younger women how to do that. 
to lead her children in a clear understanding of who Jesus is. They're also to teach the younger women to be discreet. It means pure or modest, and it's speaking specifically of moral purity of the heart. And in our culture, when we hear the word uh, purity or, or we hear the word modesty, we automatically think or immediately think of dress or apparel. But here it's much more than that. It's modesty of the heart. It, it goes much deeper than appearances. Here it means a moral conduct or control of the heart and its passions. And this is, is so important in Crete because Crete was not a moral society. Society wasn't teaching people to be moral. It was teaching them actually to be immoral. And so it was the church's job, part of the church's job, the older women in the church to train the younger women, to teach them, and to encourage them, to admonish them, or to use the word here, to admonish them to be discreet, pure, chaste. Chaste is the next one, pure in thought and act. It's sexual purity. They're also to be homemakers. And this is the one where people kind of get a little bit bothered. Okay, When I say homemaker, or when the scripture here reads homemaker, it does not mean a 1950s Leave it to Beaver uh, housewife who ha has come, her, her husband arrives home to find that dinner is prepared, his pipe is ready, his slippers are there, she's in pearls and nicely uh, uh, dressed and ready to serve him. That's not a homemaker. It might make good TV, but it's not a homemaker. That's not what Scripture is saying. So here it uses the word homemaker, and it means, it means a woman who is satisfied with her home. Boy, that carries a lot more than what our society might call a homemaker. This idea has been so attacked and, and misconstrued by society that we don't even know what it means. It means a woman should be so satisfied with her work at home that she views it as her primary responsibility before God. Now, before you call me a misogynist for saying that, let me remind you what the primary role of a man is. It is to lead his home. It's not to work. It's to lead his home biblically. Yes, of course, he needs to work. He needs to provide for his family. That's, I would say, his secondary role as a husband and a father. But his primary is to lead his home spiritually. And so I can, I can hit both men and women at the same time. I don't, I'm not hitting women, by the way. Uh, but it means here that this, these older women, these older mature people need to teach and train the younger women to be satisfied with their home life. To, to realize it is their, their highest calling is to nurture the home and to to train the children, and to love her husband, to love her children, to create a home that honors Christ. So her God-given role is to her family first. It's not to look for the greatest fulfillment outside the home. And so flip it around that way and ask yourself. I'm not saying she can't find fulfillment outside the home. She should, and she can be active in the home. In fact, in Crete, women were highly active in society business owners, strong leaders in the community, but their primary goal should be to raise and nurture a home that honors Christ. And she, a good, godly woman, can do both. Proverbs 31 would tell us that. And so her role is to her family first. Don't worry, we're going to get to the young men too. Next, the trait is good. The behavior characteristic is just good. It's a high character or a high quality of character. It means that she's full of virtue and kindness and care. I'm going to tell you as a man, there's nothing more attractive than a, a woman who is kind and gracious. Beauty fades. Beauty can be distorted. Right? Uh, other components can, can fade away, but a woman who is filled with grace and kindness can grow in her grace and kindness. Next is obedience to their husbands. It's submission. Again, not to sound like 
a misogynist in our society, but this is a very biblical thing to be obedient or submissive to her husband. It's based on partnership, not authority. It's based on partnership. And you look at the biblical headship that's listed in the Bible, and there's a couple places where God is listed and the, the son is subservient to the father. So the, the role, the biblical headship role is father, God the father, God the son, the man and the woman. And, and our society wants to turn that into a, 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 a level of importance. But just think about how unbiblical that is. Is God the son less important than God the father? Not at all. In fact, I would call that blasphemy. So this isn't, a, this isn't about roles of who's more important or valuable. This is about roles of 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 operation. And so God the Son makes himself subservient to God the Father. He sub submits to the will of the Father. And what's the will of the Father? That he would come to this world to die on a cross for sinful people. That is highly valuable. That is so important. And it parallels the will of the Father. They go together. And in the same way, a man and a woman are not, are not less important or, or less valuable. It's, it's all about roles and fulfilling the, the will of God. And so uh, a man's role very clearly in Scripture is to lead his family biblically. And a woman's role is to, to nurture and strengthen the family. And those go together. These roles are so important. They're God-given roles. The husband is the protector and the provider and the woman is the nurturer and the strengthener first corinthians eleven eleven says this nevertheless neither is the man without the woman neither the, the woman without the man and the lord for as the woman is of the man even so is the man also by the woman but all things of god now that might sound like a tongue twister to you what it's saying is neither one's more important than the other you need i mean i know this is really radical uh, biological thinking, but you need the man and the woman. And there's only two genders. So, sorry if I'm offending, but that's what Scripture is telling us. I mean, I'm not sorry. Be offended. Take it up with the Lord, not me. And they're both equally valuable. And they both have roles that are absolutely vital to the home. And here Titus is in Crete and the homes and the families are messes. And, and, and the men are often gone away in, in shipping and merchant work and piracy. And the women are, are frankly not behaving as a woman should. And the men are not behaving as men should. And the, the homes are being destroyed and it's infiltrating the church. And Paul says, Titus, you know what? I'm just going to leave you here. You need to fix all of this. I'm going to leave you here, and you need God's help, but you got to fix all these problems. Set things in order. Help people to be proper and stand out with the character of Christ. I'll remind you of one more thing, just in the, the, the aspect of obedience, that godly men are easy to submit to. And I'm going to throw this right back at the men. The godly men are easy to submit to. Ungodly men, very hard. That's why it's so important for young women to find godly men who love and pursue the truths of Scripture. Well, there's supposed to be comfort and strength in these words, right? The, the older women are to comfort and strength. That's admonish these younger women in these characteristics. And, and we're given the reason why at the very end that the word of God may not be blasphemed the failure of the older women in the church will lead to the failure of the younger women in the church and the failure leads to blasphemy a failure of young women to submit which leads to god's word being spoken ill of the truth of god being rendered ineffective when people don't fulfill their god-given roles when we seek our own priorities, we hinder God's work, especially in the church. And so the truth of Christ is attractive. It should be seen in the beauty of character of its followers, of its believers, especially of the old women and the young women of the church. All believers, though. 
So I ask you, how does your character, as a young woman, how does your character reflect the beauty of God's word? Well, let, me, let me take that out. As older women or younger women, how does, how does your character reflect the beauty of God? Maybe you need to ask yourself what conditions you're placing on love. Or, or how do you confuse modesty of the heart with modesty of dress? Or my favorite question, how is, and this is good for men too, but how is my kindness and my gracious spirit readily seen by others? All right, well, young women, old women, take a break. Breathe easy. Let's move on to the young men, which is really the old men too. So sorry, old men, I told you last week your time was done. It's really not. You, you, you get these characteristics as well. So verse 6, likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. And so we start with this sober-minded. It's been in every single one of these characteristic lists. They've been asked or challenged to be serious of mind, or, or uh, sober-minded, or mature in the way that they think. The implication here is that the older men are to come alongside the young men. In fact, that's the word exhort. The word, I've used this word before. This is, this is maybe my favorite Greek word. And I try not to talk about Greek words too much. But I love this one. It's the word parakaleo. And it means to come alongside of. And it's the idea of, of somebody who's stooped. And it could be used at times, it's used for like a soldier who's worn and weary and battle beaten. And, and somebody comes alongside them and puts their arm around them and holds them up and carries them back to safety. That's the context of that word parakaleo. The older men are to come alongside, bear the burdens of the younger, carry them along, help move them to become more like Christ. It's a great word. It's used not only of men, it's used of women in the church, it's used of people in the church. How well do we come alongside those who are hurting, struggling, frustrated, uh, unsure, and we, we help pick them up and carry them along, bring them along? How often do we do that? Well, that's the command here to, 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 to the old men to help the young men be sober or serious-minded. To be sensible is another way of saying it. Full of good judgment and self-control. And by the way, it's the qualifier for the other characteristics that are listed. I think there's six of them. The next is a pattern of good works. It literally means a, a, a mold. Uh, like if you were a tool and die worker, you understand that concept. A mold that, that makes everything else after that. It's the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, an exact replica, an impression. And so here it's an impression or a replica of good works. In other words, there's good habits right? If a man says something kind and generous, it's not the first time he's done it. You know, sometimes as men, we're like, yeah, check, did that one. I said something really kind. It was August 14th, 1996. Nailed it. Good to go. No, this is a pattern. This is a, a set of behavior that leaves an impression or a mark on other people. It, it, also, we have integrity of doctrine. It's a pattern of good theology. What we think about God that affects our heart and how we live that out. So they, they know uh, of the Lord. They know much of the Lord. They're able to use the, the, the word of God because they're well acquainted with it. Next is reverent. It means dignified. To be able to distinguish between what is unimportant and what is important. And so it's the concept of not pursuing the frivolous or the unimportant things. And so let me ask you, do the young men of our church see this in the older men of our church? That the older men of our church pursue things that are valuable? Or are they loving and pursuing hobbies more than they are Christ? The next word is incorruptible. It means not easily swayed to do wrong. 
I, I, would, I would say men of fortitude, the stick to they're, they're untouchable by sin, so that the, the same uh, sins that trip up uh, people in the world or pip, trip up the people of Crete are not going to trip up the men of the church. But it, it also carries this uh, ability uh, or, or sincerity. Uh, literally means sincere or sensible. And, and I think this is, there's a reason why. In fact, let me pause here to kind of go back. We have these traits of being sober-minded, good works, uh, a pattern of good works, doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. And we look at the, that list of things and we say, well, it's easy to look at those and say these are things you do. Right? These are actions that you demonstrate. Right? Do these things as if it's a checklist. I don't know about you. I love checklists. Do you love checklists? I have lots of checklists. The pastors know I have checklists. I have checklists for myself. I have checklists for them. I have checklists for some of you in this church even, and you don't even know it. Uh, I love checklists. It helps me keep track of things. My mind naturally gravitates to the, the things that I need to do and the tasks and how to stay organized. But that's not what this is. This isn't a checklist. This is a list of character traits. So these, yes, they're things the, that you do, you do these out of a transformed heart, right? That's the underlying current of all of these characteristics. These aren't just things you do. They're things that have, ha, are the result of a change that it t has taken place inside of you, a transformation because of Christ. And so here, this incorruptibility means they can't be tainted or easily swayed to do wrong, but it also carries the idea of sensibility or sincerity that, and, and I think there's a reason. Men sometimes are harsh. Right? I'm harsh. I speak bluntly. I know I do that. Some of you tell me. Some of you other harsh speakers tell me I speak harshly. You're blunt. You're blunt with me, and you're blunt with me because I need it sometimes. And here, we're, we're to, to speak. We're to be incorruptible, not easily swayed, but also the manner in which we do it is sincerely sensible, not with harshness. It is easy to speak harshly about sin, and, and we should, but it is hard to speak sensibly about sinners. And yet, that's what we're to do. We're untouchable by sin, but we're also to be tender towards sinners, people. In fact, we even see it in the last one, sound of speech, sound speech. Literally means health-giving speech or life-giving speech. Now, let me ask you that. Does your speech, the manner in which you say things and the things that you say, do they bring health to the hearer? Boy, if I study out the Gospels and I study out the life of Christ which we're going to actually do here in the next series, I see Christ speaking with incredible compassion and health to, to just about every single person he ever talked to, even at times to the Pharisees who are attacking him. He is tender of speech. And so as older men, we should be training the younger men to have sound speech, speech that is kind gentle, loving, edifying, and I remind you, where does that all come from? That all comes from a transformed heart. And so the focus of the men, I think, is focus. Men are, men are very focused creatures. And let me prove my point to you. This is what makes men good hunters, okay? If you've ever hunted with a, a, a man, you'll, you'll notice this. I take my daughters hunting sometimes. And I can see things that somehow they don't see far away. Yet at home, I can't see things that are right in front of my nose, right? And it's why. It's because men get focused. This is why, and men can get focused on really simple things, very simple. That's why we call men simple-minded sometimes. We get so focused on something that's really not that important, but we give it all our attention so that we don't actually hear our wife talking or our kids talking. And they're talking about things probably more important than what we're doing but we are laser focused on whatever it is. 
important or not. That's not a bad quality. I mean, that's a bad thing there. But, but it's not a bad quality to have that kind of focus. Men don't multitask. Give us one thing at a time. And we'll do it. With everything we got. But we'll do it. God's designed men that way. But the problem is that Paul is, is challenging the men of Crete and he's challenging Titus to be focused on spiritual things. The men of Crete and the people of the church of Crete are not focused on spiritual things. They're focused on other things. They're focused on themselves. They're focused on the pleasures. They're focused on their, their, their uh, comforts. They're not focused on living for Christ. And so he's trying to get them to recalibrate their focus. Listen, godly lives make an impact. And it's not just the young men, it's the old men. It's not just the old men, it's the, the young women and the old women as well. The, the entire point made strongly here with the young men is that mature believers will have a profound impact on others around them. That's called discipleship. Mature people in the church disciple other people. Mature disciples make disciples. And mature Christians have the character and the behavior that pushes for that. Notice, I like the end of this. I like it as a man. should like it as Christians as well. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, verse 8, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. In other words, to have such character, not that it's perfect, not that there's, they, they, we never make a mistake, but blameless, that, that people cannot make an accusation against us that sticks. That the worst thing they can say is, man, they're just so nice all the time. They got nothing evil to say. That should be the mark of a believer, a mature believer, what we're aiming for. By the way, 1 Peter 2.12 says the same thing. So let me ask you, as an old man or a young man, wherever you stick yourself, how have you come alongside other people to help them spiritually? Older men, younger men, what frivolous and unimportant things are you tempted to pursue? What impression are you giving to other people? Are you full of integrity or full of pride, full of harshness or full of gentleness and compassion? How does your speech demonstrate a thoughtful and a tender Savior? All right, we'll get to the last point is to mature servants. And, and this sometimes puzzles people. I don't think it's that puzzling, though. Verse 9, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So it's written to, to servants. I'll call them employees because that's really the, the, the common denominator that we would have today. It's the word doulos or bond servant here, someone who is controlled or owned by another. But here I would, again, say it's to mature Believers in the church who are working under someone else. How should we behave? Well, we have obedience listed here. This is to obey in all things. And it's not a, uh, it, it, it's an important word. It's a passive word, actually. It means to make ourselves submissive to another. So it's, it's us willingly surrendering at times our desires and our wills so that we can Serve the will and the desires of someone else. Here, it would be your employer or your boss. And it's a character trait that, that honors Christ when we're good employees. And I've said this over and over again, that Christians should be the best employees that any company has. Christians should be the best citizens that our country has. And obedience is part of that. Well-pleasing is the next word. It is, the role is to serve at the desire of the master, to be acceptable. In fact, it's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and 
acceptable to God. So we're, we're to live in such a way that we please those who are in authority over us. We're to work so hard that we make them look good, even if you have a bad boss. Right? There's no exception clause in here. And of course, why? Because God's at the top. And this should be the same thing in the church. If you're working in the children's ministry, it should be to, to, to serve well uh, the leaders of the children's ministry who are serving well the, the deacons of the church and the, who are serving well the pastors who are serving well the Lord, who are serving the church. It all builds up. Go back to the Lord. Well-pleasing. Next is not answering back. It means just not argumentative. To talk, literally to talk back. Young people would say to clap back. I'm learning all these young people words now. The pastors, we sit around and learn them together. Listen, Christians should not be known as insubordinate. Argumentative. Christians shouldn't be known as being difficult people. We should be known as being quick to obey. The next is not pilfering. That's not stealing from your master or, or putting aside for ourselves. The last one is good fidelity. I, I really like this one. It's not a word we use very often. It's showing loyalty and faithfulness. In other words, proving your worth to your employer, to your master, or proving your worth to those who are in authority over you. I tell my kids this all the time. They're probably sick of hearing it, but every Christian, and I want my kids to know this and demonstrate it, I want my kids to be indispensable at work. That every Christian should work so diligently that they become indispensable. Your boss can't let you go because you're doing so such good work. You're working harder than anyone else. You're, you're doing it with a better attitude than anyone else so that you are invaluable to the company or to the organization. Wouldn't that be a great characteristic for every Christian in this church to have in their employment setting or their service setting that they were indispensable, we couldn't do without them. It would hurt the business, or let me put it in the context of the church, it would hurt our church to lose you. Would it hurt? Our church to lose your service why why all of this it gets to the end of verse 10 that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things the word adorn I'll give you another Greek word because you'll recognize it cosmeto it's what we get our word cosmetics from Right, ladies? Well, some men apparently now. So this lady should <laughs> use cosmetics. Right? And what do they do it to make themselves more beautiful, attractive, to highlight the beauty of their face? Spiritual beauty is lasting and it only grows more radiant. And that's, as servants, as employees, as workers, that's what should happen. We should become more valuable, more important, as we demonstrate and radiate with Christ. In fact, it's in, in all things. Notice, it doesn't just say, adorn the doctrine of God at work. It says, in all things, everywhere we go. Listen, why are these commands given? This is a long passage took me two weeks, and I had to speed through it at that. Why, why is Paul telling Titus all these things? Why is God telling us all of these things, these important traits, and characteristics, these behaviors? Well, it's because we're meant to represent Christ. We're, we're meant to be beautiful for Christ. Christians are meant to be distinct from the world around them and we represent Christ who takes a vile person who is ugly and, and, and wicked and ungodly and he changes and transforms them into something that is beautiful and different and unusual and glorious 
So that the world around says, I saw what they were before, and I see what they are now. And the only thing that could have made that difference was Christ. They couldn't have done it themselves. Does your character and your behavior exemplify that? Is that what we're teaching and training to the next generation? That we're, we're training the, the younger men and the younger women in the church to love and look like Christ. Yes, there's a lot of components here of work, doing work and appearances. Yes, but it's all because of a transformation of the heart. We represent what Christ does in the life of a vile, unholy, impure person. And so as followers of Christ, can you be described as a mature disciple? Remove the word old. Remove the, the word young. Remove the word servant. Are you described as a mature disciple? And what marks of maturity come easily to you? Which ones are a little more difficult? Who can you come alongside of to bear their burdens with them? Or who can you ask to come alongside you to bear your burdens? We are called to be disciple makers. So who are you discipling? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, you are good to us. You are loving. You are kind. You are gentle. And we thank you that you take wicked, vile, immoral people and you transform them into glorious mercy givers, truth speakers, people who are gentle and thoughtful in what they say, people who willingly put aside their own desires, their own habits, their own comforts, their own desires, their own hobbies. And they live for your honor and glory by investing in other disciple makers. Lord, help us to exemplify this, that we would orient our lives just as you did to be servants. And I pray you'd help us, convict us the areas that we need it. Every one of us should need it. And so I pray you'd give grace now as we communicate with you we sing glory to you, that uh, you would rectify these things in our life, in our heart, begin to repair them so that you are praised. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.